thank you, Anil sir, for leading us in prayer. And uh, this will be the continuation of uh, our study from Book of Ephesians. Uh, we have come to Chapter 3. In the last two sessions, we studied about Chapter 3. And uh, previously, we studied uh, the mystery Apostle Paul was talking about. And we have seen in the entire chapter, we can uh, it can be segregated. And the main themes uh, can be considered as the mystery, number one. Number two is the minister. Uh, number two, prayer for the mystery or supplications for the mystery. These are the three major themes we can see uh, in Ephesians chapter 3. And even regarding the mystery also, we have come across with a few questions and we have dealt with the when of the mystery. And uh, this mystery has been planned before the foundation of the world. Uh, that's what uh, we learned. And uh, we come across the word <clears throat> uh, dispensation. Uh, the Greek word is uh, oikonomos, which is about uh, uh, handling the household matters, uh, dealing with them. That's what oikonomos, economy, our English word has come from the same word. Uh, it was talking about how Apostle Paul is handling the mystery. Uh, but it is not talking about there are various dispensations where God revealed in various uh, uh, ways and uh, there were tests, there were uh, uh, some successes and there were some failures. So God was keep progressing and keep inventing new way, ways of dealing with uh, uh, humans in order to uh, make uh, in order to qualify the humans for the, the salvation. So that is not uh, the teaching of Apostle Paul, especially taken from this word uh, mm. uh, dispensation. This word appears two times in the same book of Ephesians and in two places. It is economy, oikonomos. That's the word we learned. So when of the mystery is before the foundation of the world, but it is not talking about various dispensations. Yeah. And number two thing we have seen is the what of the mystery. The what of the mystery is the union between Gentiles and Israelites in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God has united all people together. That is the what of the mystery. Now we are going to talk about who of the mystery. Uh, and then we did, we also look for uh, why of the mystery or who of the mystery means uh, the person who was given the uh, responsibility or grace of understanding this mystery and handling this mystery as a, a good stewardship, which is Apostle Paul himself. And then the purpose of this mystery also uh, we will be looking as we are going to looking into these two aspects of this mystery. We'll also focus on uh, uh, the text mostly, and we'll we also focus on the prayer Apostle Paul uh, prays for uh, all the believers in this world. So, coming to the who of the mystery, we know it very well. This is Apostle. Paul himself in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 7 to 8 he writes of which I a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than uh, the least of all saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So this verse clearly tells that the who of the mystery is Apostle Paul himself. And he previously he attested himself or he introduced himself saying like uh, I Apostle Paul a prisoner of Christ. So this is talking about who he is. So first thing we can understand is Apostle Paul is a prisoner of Christ. In the previous, uh, in the previous Bible study, we discussed about how Apostle Paul became the prisoner of Christ. Also, uh, he was captured by Christ. He was uh, uh, sorry, he was captured by Christ, and he was captivated by Christ, uh, and he was compelled by Christ. In these three ways, uh, Apostle Paul has become a willful prisoner of Jesus Christ that we have already uh, seen. And next thing we can see is he, Apostle Paul considers uh, this ministry or this opportunity uh, to minister or to uh, be the steward for this ministry as uh, not something that he earned, but it is completely by the grace of God. And it is, he considered it as an honor and he received it as a gift in the verse itself it tells i became a minister to the gift of grace of god given to me 
so this this is talking about the mystery he received and which he has received completely by the grace of god it is not something uh, what he uh, what he learned that's why he writes to me who I am less than the least of all these episodes, uh, all the saints the grace was given in verse 8 he says so he considers it as a grace he received you know it is not something he earned by himself by his uh, religiosity or by his uh, uh, good works or by his education and he doesn't consider the mystery revealed to him as something he discovered uh, we, uh, you know, uh, it is true that Apostle Paul is a scholar in the Old Testament and we can see his humility by the words he uses itself. The word mystery uh, is not something that somebody will find found it. He says that it is not something with my knowledge I understood and I learned. And he says it was given to me by the grace of God. Such an educated person, he is speaking that. It is similar to what Jesus said to Peter. Flesh, when Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and he said, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my father who is in heaven. So there also Paul, Jesus was telling him, not by your education, not by your theology, not by your experience, you would be able to understand this mystery, but uh, it is completely by the work of God. It's completely by the grace of God we receive the mystery and we understand the uh, mystery. The same thing Apostle Paul uh, repeats here in uh, uh, related to himself. So that's why he considers it uh, as the grace and he considers it as an honor and he says that it is uh, received as a gift. And he admits that his, um, he ministers by the work of the Holy Spirit. And even how is he going to minister? It is not by his strength and by his knowledge and understanding. But he says that he is working by the work of the Holy Spirit through him. Uh, so it is a challenge for all of us to consider, you know, more, uh, well, when we are reading the scripture, many a times we think, I understood the scripture. I understand this way. I understand that way. And the, the, the reality is it is God who reveals it to us. Uh, unless God who reveal, God reveals the scripture to us, we won't be able to uh, understand. And unless God who works in us, we won't be able to minister to people. Uh, this moment, please permit me to share one of the experiences I had that was in 2012. I was traveling from a city, uh, from Hyderabad to a nearest city called Guntur. Uh, in the train, I and a businessman, only two were there in the compartment for some reason. And uh, he's a Hindu. And I did not talk to him for a long time, but uh, he's an old man, so he wanted to talk. Uh, so he asked me, who are you and what you do? And all I said, I'm a minister. Then he asked me what your Bible tells. And all. I said, oh my, it's such an opportunity for me. I can uh, share him the gospel. So I spoke about history. I spoke theology, archaeology, these, that, what, what. I spoke about everything almost for a... Uh, uh, I spoke almost for 30 minutes or something and uh, at last he asked me a simple question uh, saying like what is the main teaching of your bible then i said uh, only one commandment jesus gave us that is love your neighbor as i have loved you so that's the commandment he gave then he said oh so love, you have to love your neighbor and said yes then he said that's what our baba also teaches and I just realized what all the, uh, you know, subjects I taught, the history or archaeology, the what, what all, and they have gone nowhere. You know, they did not help me in any way. So almost for 10 minutes, uh, since then, uh, from then, uh, I didn't have any answer to say, so I was quiet. For 10, 15 minutes, I was quiet. And then somewhere deep within my heart, I felt, why don't I offer him a offer for offer a prayer for him? So I asked her, sir, can I pray for you and bless you? Then said, oh, why not? Please do that. So I prayed for him. I prayed for his business and for his family. And uh, then prayer was over. Then again, I was quiet. Then I guess he took around five, ten minutes time. And then he called me and said, you know, we went to temple several times. We always pray uh, that God bless me, bless my business. You don't know me and I don't know you, but uh, you felt to see me prosper. You prayed for me, my business to grow and to flourish. 
Oh, from this I can understand the kind of God you are serving. Oh, that was such an assault on my face. So when we want to minister gospel to people, many a times we think that it is our education and our capacity, our skills to persuade people or uh, to understand and accept the gospel. But it is the reality, it is the truth that we all need to learn that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that brings the fruit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit who convinces people's heart. We only can communicate. We cannot convince people. We only can communicate. We cannot uh, uh, change the hearts of the people. It is the only Holy Spirit who does that. And here Apostle Paul recognizes the same. And he says that his ministry was accomplished and been done by the work of the Holy Spirit, but not by his wise words. That's why he mentions in First Corinthians also, when we come to you, we did not come to you with persuasive words and we did not come to you with much wisdom. But God worked in the lives of the people through Apostle Paul, through which a huge church was established in Corinth. So we all need to understand and remember that it is God who works and leads us in this ministry. He is the one entrusted the ministry to us. He is the one given has given the mystery to us. And he is the one who uh, helps us as we are going to uh, handle this mystery as good stewards of Jesus Christ. And then uh, uh, he also meant he did not earn it. Paul here refers to himself as the least of all saints, through which he is, uh, again, the focus is not about his, uh, uh, you know, he is better or Paul is better or Peter is better, or it is not about the merits of the people. Again, the focus is about this Apostle, Apostle Paul has received it by the grace of God. That is the focus and that's what he is re-emphasizing. And then, uh, um, who uh, with this uh, who of the ministry? And we also find that uh, he was called to share this mystery among the Gentiles. Okay, Apostle Paul was designated to share the mystery among the. Uh, Gentiles. That does not mean he does not preach to Jews. Uh, if Jews comes and all, he uh, he neglects and all. It's not like that. We are in Book of Acts. We can see clearly that the strategy of Apostle Paul also first he goes to Jewish um, synagogues. If they accept, well and good. And if they don't accept, then he goes to Gentiles and uh, uh, shares. That's how he uh, did his ministry in Book of uh, Acts. But he considers himself uh, primarily he was chosen to share the mystery to the Gentiles. What is the reason to say that? The answer we can think we can it is uh, answer must be like uh, uh, if you read that uh, writings and writings and teachings of Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter. We find a distinction actually in both of their preachings. Whenever Apostle Paul uh, talks, especially regarding the gospel, he uses this mysterious word, mystery. But when Peter preaches, he uses the words fulfillment of the scripture. Uh, so that the scripture may be fulfilled or so that the prophecies may be fulfilled. Who can understand the prophecies? Obviously, Jewish people, because the, to them, only, to them belongs the Old Testament, to them belongs the prophecies and the promises. So they would be able to relate to such presentation. Uh, so uh, Peter, he preaches the fulfillment of the gospel, uh, fulfillment of the prophecies. And most of the times Peter preached among the Jews. Of course, later he preached among the Gentiles also in Rome also. Uh, he ministered. Uh, we all know about it. Uh, but but when it comes to Apostle Paul, he preaches primarily to Gentiles. His focus of his ministry is about the Gentiles. If he goes and speaks the fulfillment of the scripture, the Gentiles may not be able to understand, they may not be able to relate, and they may not be able to accept. Why do you want to force us or you know, introduce your gods or your foreign gods to us? That would be their response. So Apostle Paul preaches the mystery which was um, hidden from ages to ages. Now he revealed it through his apostles. And what is that mystery? Even Gentiles also are included in the family of God. It is like Paul, he's going to Gentile person and say, God loves the world so very much. 
and uh, you you are not aware of it he loves you also he is your father also and he made all of us to be one in jesus and he wanted to make us as his children there is no jew there is no gentile all are included then gentile might say oh you jewish people don't mingle with gentiles then he would say no 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 in jesus he broke down all the walls the walls of separation and uh, in Jesus, he united Jews and Gentiles and he made us one family. This is how prob I'm just uh, paraphrasing and guessing how prob probably Paul might have preached the gospel. So uh, in such a way, uh, he is bringing to them and he says, this is the mystery which was hidden from ages to ages. And uh, Jewish people also did not understand because it is a mystery. Now it is revealed. So we all accept it and enjoy the uh, commonwealth of Israel having one father, one savior. That is the way Apostle Paul communicated the gospel. So he preached the gospel primarily uh, to the Gentiles and he preached about the mystery. And Peter preached mostly about the fulfillment of the prophecies. Going forward, the purpose of this mystery, why this mystery has been shared with church, obviously, so that the church may be able to uh, enjoy the unsearchable riches in Jesus Christ. In but in uh, there are certain places. Few more purposes have been explained in chapter three, verse ten. Uh, Ephesians three, verse ten. Here it is written to the intent that now that manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The one of the purposes he revealed his mystery is so that we may be uh, the people who speaks to the world, share to the world. What are these uh, multifaceted, uh, what are these manifold wisdom of God? So he wants the church to be his spokespersons to share and speak about the manifold wisdom of God. Uh, to whom? To all the principalities, to all the rulers. And to all the powers, not just on earth, but even in the heavenly places. If we find that, uh, another prayer in um, Ephesians chapter 1, there also he speaks similar things. Uh, that we may share the wisdom or the knowledge of God to all the principalities and powers on earth. So God wanted the church should reveal the wisdom of God to the rulers and all Powers. And this word heavenly places, this is quite a tricky word uh, to see. Uh, all principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And uh, some say it is uh, uh, talking about the angels and demons and uh, heavenly cre creatures and all. I'm not very sure about uh, what they are. But one thing surely and very confidently I can speak about uh, that is also looking at the incarnation of Jesus Christ is God wanted to use the church to be uh, this, uh, to, to be his uh, ambassadors we can talk about to serve, to be his spokespeople to reveal his wisdom not just on earth even to angels in heavenly places also. Why am I saying that is because the fullness of God uh, uh, can be seen in Jesus. You know, the, we, when we talk about the fullness of God, where can we find the fullness of God? Can we find the fullness of God before, uh, during the creation? If you read the scripture, we don't find any of such words. Can we find the fullness of God when he was dividing the Red Sea? We don't find any scriptures that say we can see the fullness of God. Can we find the fullness of God in book of Revelation, where he comes with his power, with his angels and all his glory. And there also we don't find any description saying like that. But Apostle Paul uses this description. And in entire scripture, there is uh, the fullness of God description has been used only in two places. And that is one in Ephesians and the other one is in Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, Apostle 2 verse 9, he says, The fullness of God had bodily dwelleth in the Lord. In other words, the fullness of God can be seen in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God can be seen in 100% man and in 100% God. The incarnation is talking about the union and union between God and humans. And in that, Apostle Paul says, the fullness of God can be seen. 
so the fullness of god can be seen if it is seen in the incarnated person and uh, uh, if he is the head of the body head of all principalities and powers as the scripture uh, speaks and what about the body of his body of this head the fullness of god can be seen in the body of christ also the fullness of God can be seen in Jesus in his incarnation, union and communion between humans and God. And the same thing we are carrying on earth now. The union of God, union and uh, union between God and uh, humans. Uh, that is a great privilege God had given. That is the reason we are part of that fullness. That's why he wants us to be the revealers of God's wisdom, not just on earth, even in heaven, because even in heaven also there is no fullness of God can be seen. The fullness of God can be seen only in the flesh of Jesus Christ and whose body we are. So that is the connection I would, I would, I would like to think about to having Jesus as the center and the incarnation as the uh, center. And there may be some other perspectives. Um, I don't want to say this is the only thing. Uh, so... There may be a revelation of God's wisdom to all angels, but it is such an honor. Can, can you think about uh, these? We all think we are going to learn about God from Gabriel and all, but a Gabriel comes to us and he may, he may want to learn about God from us. That is such an honor because, because of the incarnation happened in Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the union brought between uh, Jesus and uh, humans. So, uh, church, God has chosen us. The same thing you can find in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 also. God has chosen us to be, to reveal his wisdom to principalities and powers, not just on this earth, even to uh, heaven in the heavenly places. And then comes the most interesting prayer in entire Bible, I can say. This is one of my most favorite Bibles. We can obey uh, prayers, prayers from the Bible, we can read it from uh, uh, verses 14 to 21. Actually, there are two prayers in this chapter. First prayer is in chapter 1, uh, sorry, two chapters in this uh, episode. First prayer is in chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. And the second one is chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. If you have chapter 1, 15 to 23 reads, and we discussed about it, but just I would like to make a few references here. Paul prays for the eyes of the believers to be opened uh, in Ephesians chapter uh, 1. In the first prayer, he prays that people's eyes may be opened, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. According from this, we understand the main theme of this prayer is Apostle Paul prays that our eyes and our understanding may be open so that uh, we may know the tremendous power of God which he, by which he is working in us. He wants us to know and understand the great power of God. That's what he prayed in chapter 1. In chapter 3, he prays for our heart. In the for chapter 1, he prays for our minds so that we may know, we may grow in knowledge. And in chapter 3, he prays for our hearts. And uh, verse 14 to 21, he prays for the hearts of the believer, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, so that the Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Here we can understand that one thing that he wanted us to know the tender love of Christ. There he wanted to open our understanding, our knowledge may be grown 
to understand the tremendous power of Christ. Here, our hearts may be opened and he may dwell in our hearts through which we may be able to explore the depths of God's love. So this is a distinction between uh, these two prayers and both of them are very beautiful. And uh, his supplication for this uh, prayer is, is this one. And he wants that we may know the tender love of God. And, uh, and we are not going to know this tender love of God by ourselves, to ourselves. But he said, with all the believers, we are not going to learn the love of God alone. We are going to learn and understand and enjoy and explore the love of God along with our brethren. So what is what does it tell us? It tells us there is no spirituality for Christian being independent or alone. Nobody can say, I'm okay, I'm having I'm reading my Bible, I'm reading my Bible, uh, I'm praying for myself in home. I don't need to come to church where it is full of politics and people. I mean, people church is full of hypocrites, so I don't like to come. So that is not our spirituality. And unfortunately, in the postmodern world, spirituality has become a very personal uh, aspect of human life. But according to Christianity, according to the Gospels, we understand our spirituality is not just personal. Uh, but that's why Apostle, you know, if you are only one person, we will not be able to know the love of God. He wants us to know the love of God along with the saints. In verse 18, he says, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. He can say, you may be able to comprehend the love of God. No, but he says you, he wants us to comprehend or explore the love of God along with the saints. It, re it uh, resonates with the words of Apostle John. Where he says, and if anybody say that they love God and do not love their brother, he is a liar. So you loving God or knowing the love of God can be clearly seen by the way you love your neighbor. So uh, our spirituality can be seen only with our relationships. So spirituality cannot become a personal uh, property. Nobody can be spiritual being alone. But we all can be spiritual being in community with our brethren and where we explore the love or the depths of uh, love of God together. And why do we want to explore the love of God together? Because the answer also is seen, given in the same prayer so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. So you look back, same, same words, same themes are being repeated. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And whose body is? We are. That's what Apostle Paul writes in Corinthians, sorry, Colossians. And here he says, and Christ may dwell in your heart so that we may have the fullness of God. Where can you see the fullness of God? We can see in Jesus first and then we can see the fullness of God in the church. Such an honor God has given though we know uh, that there is no perfect person in the church. There is no perfect church in the world. But still, God does not choose to seek for the perfection, but God uh, is so very much interested to share his affection with us. And he is in the process of making us uh, perfect and confirm us to the image of his son, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and we may be blameless. That's what the vision of God for us individually as well as for the church collectively. So, uh, so that the fullness of God can be dwell in us and in not just the earth, even the heavenly hosts will be able to do, learn the wisdom of God from us, from the church, because church is ultimate goal and uh, church is uh, the, his most favorite um, uh, creation, church is his most creation where he wanted to share his very existence with the church uh the same thing as it's a collation chapter 2 verse 9 and 10 says uh, for in him dwells the fullness of godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and power because of jesus we are complete in him the fullness dwells in him and he shares the same with us and then we chose the extent of god's love for uh, uh, 
what is the extent of God's love? Uh, in verse 15, we can find that he embraces entire family throughout the world and of all times. And uh, he, where it is written, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So, entire human family is involved in this heaven family, heavenly family. And that's why in previous uh, sessions also we studied, Apostle Paul does not look at non-Christians or non-believers as some uh, uh, pagans and enemies of God, but he considers them, considers them as children of disobedience. But still children. They are disobedient. They may not be, they are alien to experience the riches of God. And we are given the opportunity by the grace of God, the mystery is open to explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he, uh, so it is talking about he embraces all the humanity to himself. That's we can, that we can see in verse 15. And the beauty of his prayer is in verse 16, he speaks about how he embraces us individually. Okay, in verse 16, he speaks about uh, you, Christ may strengthen your inner man. When he said the word inner man, it is not up here talking about collective. It is not, it is talking about individual persons. Individually, your inner man may be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. That's what Apostle Paul says. So, when God looks at us, he, he embraces us collectively and he ministers to us personally and he embraces us individually also that's who, that is very clearly revealed in this prayer and this teaches about the nature of god's love what is the nature of god's love and the nature of god's love is something that is beyond our comprehension that's why in verse 13 he says verse 19 he says knowing the love of christ which surpasses all understanding which surpasses all knowledge. So we, um, uh, whatever the education we have, knowledge we have, theology we learn, whatever we, our experience we have, knowing the love of Christ is beyond everything. In other words, we will never ever be completely comprehend, completely comprehend His love. And people ask this question: What are we going to do in eternity or in heaven? And many say in heaven there will be nothing. We will be worshipping God. I feel in uh, throughout eternity we will be exploring the depths of God's love. And every day in a new manner he would be manifesting his love. Every day in a new manner he will be revealing his love. You know, you can you relate with me. Uh, sometimes when you are reading the scripture, suddenly a new revelation comes. And that fills our hearts with joy and we understand God's love. And we feel such a greatness and it remains for a few days. And imagine that happens every hour. And that happens every day. So that's how it is going to be in heaven, I feel, or in the days to come where we are, uh, we are going to see, wow, what a great love that God had extended towards us. We will be able to receive it. So uh, understanding the, the love of God is something beyond our knowledge itself, beyond our uh, perception, beyond our comprehension. It surpasses everything. And... Uh, uh, they transpire, surpasses everything, it transcends everything. Does not, that does not mean it will be alien to us. That, because the same love, the same power is going to work in our lives. This love revelation is not something, a great, um, what we call some, uh, uh, it's not like a quantum mechanics, which very few of us could understand. <laughs> Very few. It is not like that. Or it's not like string theory, which no one understands. <laughs> Even the people who teach, they say they themselves say that it is not like that. But it is something that works. It it transcends us, but it works personally within us. That's what Apostle Paul writes uh, in the last verses, verses twenty to twenty one. He where he says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly and above all things. Be above all more and he he does more than what we ask or what we can what we can even uh think 
that's what uh, apostle paul says so he, um, wait, wait a minute it's, yeah uh he to know the love of which some passes knowledge uh, he he prays that um, uh, God may work in our lives beyond our prayers itself. And here also we can see exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And by the work, who, who does this work? It, it is God who does this work. And then how he how does he work? In the same prayer it is written, he, by, the, by his power he is working in us. So by his by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is working this in us. For what is he doing? For the glory of Father, by Jesus, in the church, through all the ages, uh, and to the world, without any uh, limitations, even the uh, world uh, before us, and even the world af that's going to be uh, after us. Um, oh, one minute. Oh, it is it is shared for everyone. The last verse is really interesting. It is written now to him who is able to do God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power he works in us. That is about the Holy Spirit's work. To him, to God, be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Can you see the beautiful picture here Apostle Paul is drawing uh, where he says Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, three of them are at work in church through which they want to reveal God's glory. In other words, it is talking about the thing which, which we talk more often, perichoresis. God the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, they have their glory and they involve us into it. He so that we may participate with him, so that we all may explore God's glory together. His glory may be revealed through us. As Apostle Paul prayed in John 17, uh, they may be in us and we in us. And Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, John prays that, uh, sorry, Apostle, Jesus prays uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 17 that they may have our glory. So God wanted to share his glory with us. And he wanted, that's why his fullness, he wanted to do, reveal in us, not, uh, in, not just in Jesus, but his body, the church. He wants to reveal his glory. He wants to involve us in his very life. So this is such a beautiful and rich uh, gospel message. Apostle Paul speaks uh, uh, through this prayer, especially through chapter 3. Uh, with this, I would like to stop here. Maybe we'll discuss about the other things uh, uh, later uh, in the next Bible study. Uh, so, uh, if you have anything to add or if you want to uh, comment or uh, qu question, uh, please feel free to do that. <clears throat> yes, I, have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. In verse 10, mm. where he's saying, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God mm. might be made known by the church yes. to the principalities and powers from the heavenly places. Absolutely. We elaborate a little bit on that. What does it mean by the church? Is it the, I know somewhere it says that we will, you know, judge angels and teach angels and so on. Is he talking about that? No. Or is he that all that he has accomplished in the church is what the angels and powers in the heaven will glorify God. Uh, I personally feel like it is uh, including all of these things. Uh, the, the main thing and the glory of the things we can see uh, is like, you know, as I shared before, the fullness of God is seen in the incarnated son of God, human and God together. And he is the head whose body we are. So, the fullness of God, he is sharing with us. So, later, if any angel wants to see or know God, in uh, the way they would go, they would go to Jesus and his body to know God because there the fullness of God is, uh, to, uh, to fullness of God dwells. 
So that is where uh, we are revealing the manifold wisdom of God, not just on this earth, even in the uh, heavenly places. Uh, there may be definitely who will be judging and ruling these things. Uh, I'm not very sure about them uh, because, uh, 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 because Jesus uses some words which are very, um, you know, I, I don't know how to say the right word, which challenges our thinking. The moment we hear the word kingdom, we get the hierarchy into mind. King is there, then ministers are there. Some people will be judging and some people will be judged or some people will be ministering and leading and there will be some people led and ruled. This kind of lang the language brings all this kind of stuff. But if you remember uh, the Sons of Thunder, James and John, uh, you know, her pay, their, pay, uh, her, their mother comes to Jesus and says, uh, like, allow, allow my children to sit in the right, one, one in the right and one in the left when you come in your uh, kingdom. So Jesus understood there, uh, they are not understanding the kingdom of God. And in fact, she can tell the answer, it is not me who decides it, it's my father who decides it, right? That's the end of the, the conversation ends with that. Jesus says, it's not in my hand, it's in my father's hand. But he doesn't say that. But he says, oh, you don't know what you're asking about. And are you going to take, uh, are you going, in fact, it's going to be my next sermon in the church. <laughs> I'm sharing these points, but uh, uh, are you going to uh, uh, suffer with me? Are you going to take the baptism I have taken? Uh, and that's what he asked. He can directly tell, no, it's not my thing. It's my father who can decide it. No, but he doesn't do that because he wanted to tell the disciples, you, are, you don't know what you're asking, actually. You are asking the kingdom means uh, the moment you hear the kingdom, you wanted to seek for the glory and the power. But this kingdom is not about that. This kingdom is about suffering. And he is going to Jerusalem and then he is going to be crucified. So that's what he is pointing actually. Jesus is pointing. And Jesus is still ruling us. Do you know where is he ruling us? Many a times we think the, uh, the ruling of Jesus is from heaven. But in our hearts, let me tell you, the most powerful thing that changed and rules our heart is the cross of Jesus. <laughs> that changed our heart. So from the cross, he is ruling our hearts. Uh, so this kingdom and ruling and these things, we think about hierarchy, glory and power. But these are entirely different. That's why Jesus says, you really do not know what you're asking for. And Peter also asked after the resurrection, before his ascension, uh, Jesus, when you come back this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says, it's none of your business. <laughs> In other words, you are not able to understand still. Then Pentecost comes. And after Pentecost, there are no conversations about this. The disciples never talked about these kind of things. They changed entirely the message and everything changed. Uh, so now, coming back to this, I'm not speaking dogmatically. It may involve uh, the judging of angels and all, but I would like to say, like, keep it little open because Jesus always oh, keep our minds open. Jesus always surprises us. So this kingdom can be different. You know, let us be curious about what is going to be revealed. Does it make any sense, sir? Yeah. I, was, I mean, I was specifically asking the role of the church in uh, declaring to the heavenly places. Yeah, because in the very existence of the church as the body of Christ, we are revealing God's fullness and we are revealing the wisdom of God. Yes, understood. Any more thoughts? Praveen, sir, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a very general question for you. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, Christ told Peter, sir, flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Oh, okay, sir. If uh, all spiritual knowledge, understanding, truth, and love 
are an act of revelation, mm. then uh, what role as spiritual disciplines like Bible study, prayer, fellowship, attending church got to do? Mm. That's a very, very nice question, Uncle. I appreciate that. The spiritual discipline does not give us the uh, revelation of God. Let me tell you again. The prayer, your reading of the scripture, your disciplines, your meditations are not going to give the knowledge of God. They are going to, oh, sorry, God alone can give his knowledge, which we are talking, uh, which we are calling it revelation. We understand God only by his revelation, not by any of our spiritual disciplines. But what does the spiritual disciplines do? Spiritual disciplines change us. They help us to be receptive and perceptive. So the discipline does not give us any knowledge or understanding of God, but the disciplines help us and prepares us so that we may be able to receive what God is revealing. Does it make any sense? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you balanced it very well. Uh, uh, balancing, na? I mean, uh, you gave a very perfect understanding. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts? So in case uh, if there are no more uh, points to add or to questions, uh, we'll close our Bible study. Can I request uh, uh, Uncle Franklin to lead us in the concluding prayer? Yeah, yeah. One second, sir. Yes, please. So can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. A gracious Lord, a loving Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all your mercies, all your compassion. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to come to you. And we thank you, Lord, for working in us individually and collectively as a body of Christ. Lord, thank you, Father. Today, Lord, you have made it eminently plain, Lord, that we cannot understand your love we cannot understand who you are. We cannot understand anything unless you intervene. Lord, we pray that your mercies and grace be with us for each and every one of us, just as you loved the whole world before the foundations of the earth were laid. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. Fill us, Lord, with your love and help us, Father, to grow in your love day by day, into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you. Lord, please mold us and help us, Lord, to reflect your love, to be ambassadors of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for all our, for all your servants, Dan, Praveen, Sachin. Thank you so much, Father. And thank you, Lord, for all of us who are on this special platform. We ask your blessings upon all of us. And Lord, in the right time and in the right way, you will call even those who are unable to understand or who struggle to understand with the grips, with the big issues of life. Where did we come from? What's life all about? Where are we heading? Lord, touch their hearts, open their minds and bless them, Lord. We ask your blessings upon all of us and upon all the recipients too. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we ask all this. Amen. 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 Thank you, Uncle, for praying. Thank you all for joining. I wish you all have a good night and good morning to Anil sir and Rekha. Good night, everyone. Good night, Vanessa. Thanks for joining.